Good afternoon. Happy Thursday. So over the past four days, there have been protests against MONESCO and Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. A number of these protests have turned violent, resulting in the unacceptable and tragic deaths of UN peacekeepers and UN police officers and Congolese protesters. The United States offers our condolences and deepest sympathies to the families, the friends, and colleagues of those killed, as well as to MONESCO and to the United Nations. MONESCO plays a critical role in fostering peace and security, protecting civilians, and facilitating delivery of humanitarian assistance. We call on the national and local authorities in the DRC to ensure the protection of MONESCO sites and personnel, and for protesters to express their sentiments peacefully. We appreciate the government of the DRC's commitment to investigating these events and holding accountable those responsible. The United States underscores that attacks against UN personnel and facilities are contrary to international law. Freedom of expression, including peaceful protest, must be allowed, but not violence. Next, today the Department of State published our annual investment climate statements, which describe the investment climates of more than 160 countries and economies around the world. The investment climate statements help U.S. companies make informed business decisions. They also serve as a reference for foreign governments seeking to mobilize high-quality, sustainable investments as they drive continued economic recovery from the pandemic. A welcoming investment climate can help attract high-quality, durable investments and support the global economic recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. The reports highlight those areas in which countries have improved local investment conditions, as well as remaining barriers that may hinder opportunities for U.S. businesses. Successful global economic recovery from the pandemic must be grounded in sustainable, equitable, and inclusive growth. To that end, the statements not only cover market conditions, but they assess how governments uphold international labor standards, enable responsible business conduct, combat corruption, and implement policies to mitigate and adapt to the effects of, climate, of the climate crisis. The statements can be found online on our website. And finally, I am pleased uh, today to announce that uh, we are marking the 100th anniversary of unbroken diplomatic relations between the United States and Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The story of these steadfast relationships is a remarkable one. Our relationships have withstood the brutal and illegal Nazi and, so and Soviet occupations of the Baltic states until Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania courageously reclaimed their independence, rebuilt their nations, and became active and committed members of the UN, NATO, and the EU. Today we stand together as close friends, strategic partners, and strong allies, deeply committed to defending our democratic institutions, our human rights, and our freedoms. The United States is proud to join with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania as we work together to support the democratic aspirations of their European neighbors and others around the world and stand with the Baltic nations in support for Ukraine amid Russia's brutal invasion. Whether our countries are protecting the rule of law, sharing lessons of e-governance, or standing up for fundamental freedoms, the United States is more committed than ever to stand with you as our democracies rise to the challenge of this moment. And here's to the next hundred years. With that, Matt. Okay, thank you. Uh, happy uh, day after the close. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a word for that. Like kind of a boxing day. Um, uh, following up on the Secretary's remarks from yesterday uh, on, uh, on Russia, um, has there been any um, movement on either the uh, Proposal that you have submitted or on arranging the Secretary's phone call with um, Foreign Minister Lavrov? So, as you heard from the Secretary yesterday, uh, we have expressed interest. We have made clear uh, to the Russian Federation uh, that uh, we are seeking a conversation between Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, before the Secretary spoke yesterday, we had made contact uh, with our uh, with the appropriate Russian counterparts uh, to put in a call request. Uh, the Russians acknowledged that call request yesterday. Uh, we have continued to go uh, back and forth. Uh, as you know, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, is in the midst of uh, travel, so I don't have any update to provide in terms of when they may be able to connect, uh, but we continue to discuss that in the appropriate channels. Uh, among the issues that the Secretary outlined uh, that he would broach uh, with Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, first and foremost in this case, uh, is 
uh, the continued wrongful detention of Brittany Griner uh, and Paul Whelan. Uh, as part of that, the secretary said yesterday that we had put forth, uh, put forth a substantial proposal uh, and that he would seek to use that call uh, to attempt to move towards a resolution uh, on the basis of that substantial proposal. Uh, so the call, of course, has not happened. He has had, not had an opportunity uh, to seek to do that with Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, but it is something that we are continuing to pursue, and we continue to expect that they'll have an opportunity to uh, speak in the coming days. Okay, but um, uh, pr presumably the substantial proposal wasn't submitted to Foreign Minister Lavrov, so I'm just curious if there's been any move aside from a conversation, or do you not expect there to be any movement on this? Until, or until at least after uh, the, they speak? Well, let me back up. We have conveyed this substantial proposal directly and repeatedly uh, to Russian counterparts. We have done so over the course of several weeks. Uh, I, it had been our hope that right. with the uh, conveyance of this uh, proposal, uh, that we would, be able, we would have been able to uh, resolve these cases um, before right. we got to this point. But, but is it your analysis or is it the thinking of the administration that you, you don't think that the Russians will respond or there will be any movement on the proposal until after conversation between Lincoln and Lavrov? I, I will leave it to uh, the Russians to speak to uh, their willingness. Uh, it has consistently been our hope. We have sought to resolve these cases to see Paul Whelan, Brittany Griner, uh, freed, um, as soon as we started working these cases. Uh, so the fact is that we are now escalating this to the level uh, of the secretary in the hopes of moving this to resolution. But again, uh, this substantial proposal has been on the table for uh, weeks now. Uh, there is no reason to delay this. Uh, every single day that Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner uh, remain behind bars, uh, it is injustice compounded on itself. Uh, our goal is to see these cases uh, resolve just as soon as we can. La last one for me. Um, and you said that you still, you even though you haven't heard back about the call, that you still expect it to happen in, in quote, unquote, the coming days. So um, does that mean that you still think it will happen before the weekend or before next week? I, I, I couldn't say. We're continuing to discuss logistics. Uh, I don't have anything specific to offer at this point. Jane. Thank you. On China. Um, Can we stay on this same topic? Before? Sure. We'll stay on the same topic. For, uh, sure. Is there any scenario? At this point, that this call might not happen. Because the secretary was very diplomatic yesterday. He said he expects to speak with President Lavrov. Well, uh, we do expect to speak uh, with Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, we request, we put in a call request yesterday before you heard from uh, the secretary. It remains our expectation that the two uh, will have an opportunity to speak. But again, uh, I don't have any uh, updates to add at this point in terms of specific timing. Thank you much. And one more question on this one. Uh, is there any concern that given Russia's previous behavior, uh, you know, the way they behave after they achieve what they want to uh, see, um, that this call, potential call, might embolden Russian actions in Ukraine, even though the Secretary made it clear that it's not happy about Ukraine? Well, that's part of our, uh, that's part of the reason why you heard directly from the Secretary yesterday. Uh, the Secretary uh, felt it important to be very clear about what a call with Foreign Ma Minister Lavrov would entail. Uh, and just as importantly, in some respects, what it wouldn't entail. Uh, and so you heard directly from the secretary that first and foremost, uh, he wanted to convey clearly and directly, personally to Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, the priority we attach and have always attached uh, to the prompt return of Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan, both of whom are held uh, unjustly in Russia. Uh, two, uh, he wanted to reiterate uh, what Foreign Minister Lavrov has heard from much of the world uh, regarding uh, the message about food security and uh, more, more accurately food insecurity uh, that has uh, been exacerbated by Russia's uh, brutal aggression against Ukraine. Uh, he, uh, the secretary intends to uh, underscore the message uh, that we have uh, conveyed previously that other countries have as well, uh, that we welcome uh, this deal, uh, but a deal in principle is distinct from a deal in practice. And we want to see this deal fully implemented. And uh, an important part of that uh, is seen to it that Russia upholds the commitments it has made uh, with 
Turkey, with the UN, and in this case, uh, with Ukraine. Uh, and then third, uh, the secretary wanted to convey uh, a very uh, stark message on our continued concerns uh, that Russia may seek to annex by force uh, parts of sovereign Ukrainian territory. Uh, we have heard very concerning statements, including in some cases, from Foreign Minister Lavrov himself. The secretary quoted Foreign Minister Lavrov yesterday, uh, who said uh, just in recent days that Russia's uh, geographic aims go uh, well beyond um, the Donbass and uh, potentially include other regions. Uh, we thought it prudent uh, that Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, hear directly from Secretary Blinken uh, the message that annexation by force would be a stark uh, violation of the UN Charter, of international law, uh, and that it would carry with it uh, profound costs and consequences uh, from much of the world. That is what the Secretary expects to have an opportunity to convey. Uh, importantly, however, uh, you also heard from Secretary Blinken yesterday that this would not be a negotiation about Ukraine. Uh, this would not be uh, a return to business as usual. Uh, that is for Ukraine uh, to take up with Russia. And our Ukrainian partners have made very clear uh, that they are ready uh, and they, have, they are fully cognizant uh, that Russia's aggression against Ukraine will end, must end, through dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, at the same time, we haven't seen any indications from uh, Russia that it is uh, currently, presently interested uh, in engaging in constructive dialogue uh, and diplomacy. Uh, so we'll continue to support Ukraine uh, until uh, Russia is ready to engage with them uh, diplomatically, constructively, through dialogue. Uh, you heard from the Secretary yesterday about the massive levels uh, of that support uh, to strengthen Ukraine's hand on the battlefield, evidence of which we're, we continue to see uh, every day, and ultimately uh, to strengthen Ukraine's hand at any negotiating table that emerges. Anything else on this? Yes. Uh, sure, Shannon. Um, so I asked the Secretary uh, earlier this month, the G20 summit, specifically if there was a price to pay for Americans like Britton Greiner and Paul Whelan for his lack of engagement with his Russian counterpart. He said the same thing, basically, Russia's not ready to engage in meaningful diplomacy. Can you tell us where that calculus shifted and also that substantial proposal that is for the freedom of Greiner and Whelan? Do you see any scenario where the U.S. completes a deal where just one of those detainees comes home? So let me make a couple points. Uh, what you heard yesterday uh, from the secretary, uh, of course, that, that isn't something we do every day, um, but this is a horrifying practice uh, that um, puts lives uh, in the balance. Uh, and in, in cases, it calls for extraordinary uh, tactics and measures. And uh, a few things to your question. Um, the secretary wanted to, uh, and we wanted to convey very clearly and directly uh, to Foreign Minister Lavrov. So there is no mistake in Moscow. The priority we attach to the prompt resolution of these cases, meaning the prompt release of Paul Whelan and Brittany Greiner. We believe that now that this message, this substantial proposal has been conveyed directly and repeatedly through appropriate channels in recent weeks, course, without resolution, uh, then now was the time for the secretary to convey that message uh, very clearly. Uh, there are uh, a range of concerns we have with Russia. Uh, the continued wrongful detention of, of these two individuals uh, is one of them, but uh, there are other issues uh, that are vital priorities to us uh, and also to the international community. I mentioned uh, two of them already. Concerns regarding potential annexation by force. Uh, and then the fact that it remains incumbent on Moscow uh, to uphold its commitments uh, to uh, the international community, but specifically in this case uh, to Turkey, to Ukraine, uh, and to the UN regarding the grain deal. So again, this is not an opportunity for uh, these two foreign ministers to engage in a negotiation. Uh, this is an opportunity for Secretary Blinken uh, to convey very clearly, uh, very directly uh, on these areas that are of vital interest to us. 
Yes. So the second part of the question. Uh, which was. Uh, ag or? Again, it is it is uh, our priority to see both of them uh, released uh, as swiftly, uh, as promptly uh, as 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 could be possible. Have you heard any response to this proposal since it was presented weeks ago to Moscow? Um, have there been any counter proposals from from the Russians? And is the U.S. prepared to add more to the proposal on the table if that's what it would take to, to make the Ryder and Dylan help? Jenny, it is not our intention to negotiate uh, in public. It's not in our interest to do so. Uh, it is uh, there is one single overriding uh, interest that we have, and that is the prompt release. Uh, Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. Uh, we are going to be careful uh, in everything we do and everything we say, uh, not to run afoul of that overriding priority, not to do anything, not to say anything uh, that might set back that ultimate cause. So I'm just not going to get into the details uh, beyond what you heard from the Secretary yesterday. We consider this to be a substantial proposal. Uh, we've conveyed it repeatedly, directly over the course of several weeks. Uh, the fact that now several weeks later uh, we are where we are, um, I think you can read into that uh, as being a reflection of the fact that um, this has not moved uh, to the extent we would like. Uh, and we want to make very clear to the Russians directly, uh, in this case in a conversation with Secretary Blinken, uh, the priority we attach to this. And can I quickly follow up? Do you have any update on Mark Fogel's case and whether he'll be deemed wrongfully detained? I, there's nothing uh, additional I'm in a position to uh, offer at this stage. Uh, I addressed um, this issue broadly uh, earlier this week, uh, made a point of saying that uh, we are providing all appropriate uh, assistance uh, to Americans who are detained in Russia. We continue to call on Moscow uh, to provide regular, consistent consular access uh, to our embassy, to Americans who are in pretrial detention, to Americans who have been sentenced uh, in Russia. Uh, and again, uh, there has been uh, a discussion of this process of uh, determining whether someone is wrongfully held. Uh, what I will say is that uh, in all cases, uh, we consistently review the totality of the circumstances. Uh, and without going into, into a particular case, uh, I will just say that uh, we are always looking at developments. Uh, we are always looking at uh, those circumstances uh, in determining uh, whether someone may be wrongfully held. Yes. Uh, anything else on this? Uh, Go ahead. In China and sure. uh, President Biden called the Chinese here, here this morning. But the Chinese foreign minister, uh, ministry spokesman announced today that China will take crucial actions while House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visit Taiwan. Do you know what a crucial actions is? Uh, when it comes to President Biden's conversation today with uh, President Xi, the White House issued uh, a readout just a few moments ago. I expect uh, you or your colleagues will have an opportunity to hear uh, more about that call from uh, my colleagues at the White House. So I will uh, refrain from uh, commenting on that. Uh, again, we have all heard the statements uh, from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I suspect they too have heard uh, our statements. Um, it is not for us to speak to any potential travel of any member of Congress, uh, and that includes the, the Speaker of uh, the House in this case. I understand that uh, her office has not uh, announced or confirmed uh, any travel. What it is for us to do, on the other hand, uh, is to provide members of Congress, including, of course, the Speaker of the House, uh, with relevant uh, information and context uh, for any potential travel. Uh, that includes security considerations, that includes geopolitical uh, considerations, but uh, we're just not going to detail any such conversations. The North Korea, uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un announced through the Korean Central News Agency yesterday that he was making full preparation to deter nuclear war and warned of the uh, annihilation of the South Korean government and the military. He also warned that the war would uh, break out on the Korean Peninsula if the Korea, uh, US and Korea exercise was continued. What is your comment on that? 
The comments we've heard in recent hours are not categorically different from what we've heard from the DPRK regime uh, over the course of recent months and, and recent years, unfortunately. Uh, we're not going to respond to them. Uh, I think it is uh, fair to say that uh, the uh, DPRK uh, also won't be surprised to hear uh, the same message from us, and that is our commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea uh, and Japan, uh, a commitment that remains ironclad. Uh, the DPRK, as we've consistently said, said, constitutes a threat to international peace and security in the global nonproliferation regime. Uh, we have a vital interest in deterring the DPRK, defending against its provocation or the use of force, limiting the reach of the most dangerous weapons programs, and above all, uh, keeping the American people, our deplor deployed forces uh, in the region, and our allies uh, safe from any threat to international peace and security. And to that end, we continue to consult closely uh, with Japan, with the ROK, uh, and with partners throughout the broader Indo-Pacific region uh, and beyond on the threat that is posed by uh, the DPRK's WMD programs. Uh, how is the United States approaching, uh, currently approaching the North Korea? What, when, I mean, is, where are we now? Well, we are not, unfortunately, in a markedly different place than we have been in for uh, quite some time. Um, uh, as you know, Jenny, we've, uh, we undertook in the early part of this administration a policy review to determine uh, the most effective approach to the DPRK. Uh, the result of that policy review uh, was and is a policy that seeks to uh, advance our overriding objective uh, of the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula through dialogue, through diplomacy, uh, through uh, concerted uh, partnership with our uh, treaty allies. Uh, we have been able to pursue uh, a core element of that, uh, the um, uh, deepening our partnership uh, with our treaty allies, in this case, Japan and the ROK, uh, both on a bilateral basis as well as on a trilateral basis. Uh, the President, Secretary Blinken, Deputy Secretary Sherman, uh, our special envoy for the DPRK, Sung Kim, uh, all of them have uh, been in a position to convene um, our uh, Japanese and South Korean counterparts in a trilateral format uh, to discuss uh, the broad threat to international peace and security that uh, the DPRK poses. At the same time, in, in virtually all of these engagements and consistently from here and elsewhere, uh, we've made the point that uh, we harbor no hostile intent towards the DPRK. And in fact, uh, we seek to engage in the dialogue, in the diplomacy, uh, that we feel could be most effective uh, towards advancing the goal we share uh, with our treaty allies and with other partners in the region and around the world uh, to promote that shared goal of, uh, of the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, now, of course, uh, we have not heard a substantive uh, response or uh, certainly any indication that uh, the DPRK at present is uh, seeking to take us up on that offer. But in the interim, we'll continue to coordinate closely uh, with our uh, treaty allies uh, and we'll continue to impose uh, costs and consequences uh, should provocations continue to emanate from the DPRK. Thank you. Uh, yes. Can you talk about the Chinese Americans who are believed to be wrongfully detained by the Chinese government or who are under active bans. Uh, was that addressed during President Biden's call with the Chinese President Xi Jinping? And is there any progress to bring them home? Thank you. Uh, what I would say, Nike, is that uh, in all relevant conversations with countries around the world, uh, we raise cases of Americans who are wrongfully or arbitrarily detained or Americans who are otherwise unable uh, to leave a particular country on their own free will. Uh, that is uh, no exception in the case of the PRC, um, but it's just not something that um, I'm going to be in a position to detail from here. Is there a substantial proposal to the Chinese similar to the one to the Russian? What, what I would say is that countries around the world where this is applicable know the priority we attach to seeing to it that uh, to see to it that Americans uh, who are arbitrarily detained or wrongfully uh, held behind bars or otherwise prevented from leaving the country in cases of a coercive exit ban, for example, they know the priority we attach to that. Uh, they know 
uh, that we are going to continue uh, to seek to resolve uh, these cases on a bilateral basis. Uh, um, I recognize the White House will be briefing on the on the Biden Xi call, but just to go back to that for a second, um, your counterparts in the Chinese Foreign Ministry have already issued a readout on the call, um, and they kind of pointedly failed to use the word constructive to describe the talks, which they have used on uh, previous occasions. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, previous occasions be be for the Biden and Xi conversations, I'm just wondering, do, does the State Department believe that this call was constructive in terms of a high-level engagement between the U.S. and China. And uh, I'm just wondering if I can get your assessment of the, the current trajectory of uh, U.S.-China ties. I, I will say uh, just one thing. Secretary Blinken uh, was in attendance. He was at the White House uh, for this call. But again, I'm going to let uh, my White House counterparts uh, characterize this call. What I can say from uh, our part here at the State Department, of course, Secretary Blinken, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, had an opportunity to engage uh, uh, Director, uh, State Counselor, uh, and Foreign Minister Wong um, in Bali. We found that engagement to be constructive uh, and to be useful on key fronts, but uh, perhaps um, no front is more important than uh, the fact of that engagement, uh, keeping open the lines of communication, uh, ensuring that uh, we are doing everything we can uh, to ensure that the competition that defines the relationship between the United States and China, the most consequential bilateral relationship uh, we have, uh, does not veer from competition into conflict. So again, I'll defer to uh, my White House colleagues, but that has been our experience, including uh, with the most recent engagement that, uh, foreign, uh, that uh, Secretary Blinken had with Foreign Minister Wong. Uh, Sean. Um, could I ask you two things in Europe, um, unrelated? Uh, in Greece, uh, the top court, I believe it was yesterday, ruled uh, effectively in favor of Iran, which has complained about the seizure of a, of a Russian-operated oil tanker with its, its oil on there. Does the United States have any comment on this? Um, does, and where does it go from here? Well, this case went through the Greek judicial process. We're respectful of that, but we don't have a comment beyond that. You don't regret uh, that it didn't go what's perceived as the United States' way. It, it went through the Greek judicial system. Okay. Uh, something completely different, uh, Hungary, of uh, uh, Prime Minister Orban um, has drawn some, some attention and criticism and some comments uh, talking about how um, Europeans do not, uh, I think his words was, mix races with, with people of other, uh, of non-European ancestry. Does the United States have any, does the United States want to weigh in on this? Well, uh, Individuals from this building uh, have commented. Deborah Lipstadt, um, our uh, special envoy, uh, uh, commented on this. She called uh, these comments. Uh, she said she was deeply alarmed uh, by uh, this rhetoric. Uh, she made the point that rhetoric of this nature is inexcusable. Um, in uh, some 75 years after the end of the Holocaust, uh, what I would only element I would add is that, um, and this is a point we've said before, uh, what binds the United States uh, and our allies uh, around the world, uh, with Hungary being an important ally, uh, not only shared interests, uh, but also shared values. And the remarks that we heard from Prime Minister Orban are not reflective uh, of the shared values uh, that tether the United States. Uh, to Hungary uh, that serve as a foundation uh, between the relationship between our two peoples uh, and that serve as a basis for the relationship uh, between uh, the United States and uh, our other allies, whether, whether it's in Europe, uh, the Indo-Pacific, uh, or elsewhere. Yes? Um, a few on Iran, if that's okay. Um, do you see the release of Murad Tabaz as a, a positive sign for the other Americans held in Iran, or is this strictly tied to the Oman facilitated UK Iran prisoner. Let me just say on his release, uh, and you, you may have seen this, but we welcome the news uh, that Iran has released uh, US UK citizen Murat Tabaz from prison, that he's been uh, since released on bail. Uh, we're grateful to Oman, we're grateful to the UK uh, for continuing to press Iran to fulfill this commitment. Uh, it remains one of our utmost priorities uh, to secure the release and the safe return, ho return home. Uh, of wrongfully detained uh, Americans, and that includes Murad Tabaz. Uh, we've talked about this uh, before, uh, and I think uh, Secretary Blinken alluded to it just, just yesterday. 
But the fact is that Iran is unjustly detaining innocent Americans and others uh, and should release them immediately. Iran should also account for the fate of Bob Levinson. This is an issue that Secretary Blinken, that Special Envoy Mali, that our Special Presidential Envoy uh, for Hostage Affairs, Roger Karstens, um, they regularly speak to the families of these wrongful detainees. Uh, they uh, keep them apprised uh, of our efforts to bring them home, of the priority uh, we attach to this. I'm not going to speculate on what the uh, furlough of Murad Tabaz uh, may signal uh, beyond reiterating that the release of the Americans uh, who are wrongfully detained in Iran is a utmost priority for us. And then um, on Borrell's proposal, you said earlier this week that the U.S. would be swift with its review. Has the U.S. shared its, its response with the EU? We, we've been in touch uh, with our European allies. Uh, we continue to uh, uh, remain in close contact uh, with our uh, P5 plus one partners in this regard, uh, including, of course, uh, our European allies in this. Uh, we are reviewing the draft understanding. Uh, we uh, plan to do so uh, swiftly. We'll share any reactions we have with the EU directly. Yes. Um, on the Ukraine grain deal, are there any new estimates for when ships can start exporting grain out of the ports? Uh, for that, uh, I would need to refer you to the UN and the other parties responsible for uh, this agreement. Uh, our position continues to be that uh, ships in the first instance, never should have stopped uh, the effective blockade that Moscow has instituted against uh, Ukraine never, sh have, uh, never should have been put in place uh, in the first case. Uh, but now that this deal has been reached, it needs to be swiftly implemented. And again, uh, a deal on paper is different from uh, a deal in practice. Uh, and it is incumbent upon Moscow uh, to do everything it can, not only uh, to the letter of the, of the agreement, but also consistent with the spirit of the agreement uh, to see to it that uh, ships are able to leave, shippers have the confidence uh, to be able to do so, and the millions of tons of grain that has been ready to go for weeks, in some cases for months, uh, can start to leave from Ukraine's uh, Black Sea ports. Um, but it's not for us to uh, provide updates as to when that might happen, but we are going to continue to do everything we can uh, to facilitate the swift implementation of this deal, but ultimately uh, the responsibility uh, for its successful implementation uh, rests with Russia. And then on a different topic, the G7 condemned Myanmar's executions today. Is the U.S. planning on taking any additional steps, sanctions to further condemn the killing? All options are on the table. Uh, we have uh, consistently said that as long as the junta continues to stand in the way, uh, uh, in the way of a uh, return to uh, Burma's path to democracy, we will continue to impose costs and consequences uh, on the junta. Uh, we are, again, looking at all potential options to do so. We're considering uh, and um, discussing some of those options with uh, partners in the region. Uh, and beyond. We are also cognizant of the humanitarian uh, concerns and the humanitarian imperatives uh, facing the people of Burma. So, of course, we're going to calibrate uh, our response uh, consistent with uh, uh, what is in the best humanitarian interests uh, of the Burmese people. But uh, as long as um, the junta continues its repression, as long as its uh, senseless violence continues, uh, against the people of Burma, as long as it continues to stand in the way of a return to Burma's democratic path, uh, will continue to increase the costs. Yes. Thank you so much. John Zevali from Airway News Pakistan. A couple of weeks ago, uh, there were a few media reports uh, in Pakistan claimed that a uh, close associate of Prime Minister Khan, former Prime Minister Khan, met with Assistant Secretary of State Donald Liu here in State Department and conveyed the message like to forget the past and move forward. Is it any kind of meeting held here? Uh, again, um, uh, if there was any such meeting, I, I just uh, not in a position to, to speak to it. Uh, we have uh, we remain engaged with a range of stakeholders uh, in Pakistan, uh, with those currently uh, in government and a and a and a, and a broad array of others. Uh, but I'm just not in a position to speak to any such meeting. Uh, Prime Minister Khan is leading a campaign in Pakistan, and the slogan of his campaign is like. He will not be a slave of America. But with the current political wave in Pakistan supporting Khan, is U.S. thinking to open a window to talk to him? 
what we've said on this uh, before remains uh, true. We support the peaceful upholding of constitutional and democratic principles, uh, including respect for human rights. Uh, we don't support one political party over another. Uh, we support those broader principles of the rule of law uh, and equal justice under the law. So one last question. Last week, uh, Special Assistant to Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif met uh, with, sec with Assistant Secretary of State here. Uh, can you confirm that meeting? Tariq Fatmi was here. I, I'm not in a position to confirm that, but uh, if we have anything to, to add or to confirm, we'll let you know. Yes. Um, uh, uh, supposedly, the Israeli uh, security minister is has a meeting at the State Department today. Um, with whom is he meeting, and what topics are they discussing? Uh, I suspect you will see a, a readout from us later today, but Deputy Secretary Sherman is looking forward uh, to, to welcoming uh, the minister, and I suspect you'll see a readout after the meeting. Yes. A um, few questions on Iraq. Um, on diversity visa um, uh, applications, there are f quite a few people that are waiting for interviews in Baghdad embassy. Is there a plan to resume the interviews there? And then on immigrant visa for Iraqis who, have, who are waiting for their interviews in Ankara, um, can you share anything on those? When do they re resume? When it comes to diversity, uh, visa uh, applicants. Uh, there's uh, not much I can say on this front. There is uh, litigation. Uh, these cases are pending before the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Uh, and of course, we uh, just have a policy of uh, not commenting on any pending uh, litigation. Um, when it comes to broader immigrant visas, including those uh, in uh, awaiting their interviews in, in Ankara, um, we are committed to facilitating legitimate travel to the United States for both immigrants and non-immigrant travelers. Uh, our visa services are fully open for business. Nearly all U.S. embassies and consulates have resumed full visa services. Uh, Embassy Baghdad, um, to your question, is an exception since uh, as of January 1st of 2020, consular services, including in-person uh, visa interviews, were suspended uh, due to an attack uh, on our facility. Uh, we have got guidance on our website for how residents of Iraq can request to have their cases processed uh, at other posts. Um, more broadly, we are reducing uh, visa appointment wait times in all visa classes as quickly as we can. This is happening uh, around the world. And in fact, uh, visa processing is rebounding faster than uh, even we projected after a near complete shutdown uh, and freezing of resources during the pandemic. Uh, immigrant visa processing worldwide uh, is almost back to normal levels with pandemic induced backlog uh, already down about 25%. Uh, and interview wait times vary by location and by visa categories. Uh, but as always, travelers should check the website of the nearest embassy or consulate for information. And then, uh, if, if I may, um, where does the administration stand on the Iraqi government's call for a total and complete withdrawal of Turkish forces from Iraq? Uh, again, we have, you've heard this from us uh, in the aftermath of uh, the attack just a few days ago. Uh, the principle of Iraq sovereignty uh, is one that uh, we uphold. Uh, we stand with uh, Iraq. Uh, foreign forces uh, are in Iraq at the invitation uh, of the Iraqi government consistent with the principle of Iraqi sovereignty. And then the last one, um, the political deadlock in Iraq, the Iraqis failure to form a government. Does that raise concern here? Um, just yesterday, protesters loyal to Sadr uh, stormed the Iraqi parliament in, in protest of uh, a new candidate for prime minister. On the issue of the protests, uh, whether it's in Iraq or, or elsewhere, we believe that uh, public demonstrations are a fundamental element of all democracies. Uh, but there is no place for violence uh, in these demonstrations, either on the part of security forces uh, or on the part of protesters. Uh, we've consistently reaffirmed our commitment to a strong, stable, prosperous Iraq. Uh, Long-term, deep, multifaceted, and strategic partnership with Iraq serves both our interests as well as Iraq's uh, interests. We've urged all parties uh, to uh, remain calm. On the broader question of, of government formation following the elections, uh, we're prepared to work with the government that puts Iraqi sovereignty and the best interests of the people of Iraq uh, at the heart of its agenda. 
what, what does that prepare mean? Do you guys have a communication with the Iraqis uh, on that? Uh, we are in close contact with our Iraqi partners. It's a matter, of course, uh, from our embassy uh, in Baghdad as well as uh, senior officials here. Uh, and uh, this is uh, not a process in which we involve ourselves, uh, the internal political process. Uh, but again, we stand ready to uh, work with any Iraqi government that puts uh, the interests of the Iraqi people at the heart of its agenda. Uh, I want to just come back to Iran. Um, you know, I wonder, um, based on reviewing the text that, that, that um, Dorel has come up with, um, you know, do you see a likelihood of talks being resumed? Um, you know, how, how, how sort of positive are you that this could be like a new opening? Um, Iran has welcomed the, the EU's diplomacy, but, you know, there's also the backdrop that uh, the British spy chief was in the US last week and was basically saying um, he doesn't think that, that Iran really wants to do a deal. You know, where, where do you stand on that? So I would say a couple things. One, on the proposal that's been put forward by um, the EU High Commissioner, uh, again, we will be in touch directly, and we have been in touch directly with our European uh, partners on this. We're reviewing that. Uh, we'll convey any feedback directly uh, to our European allies in this case. But it is our understanding uh, that the proposal that uh, Mr. Burrell put forward uh, was based on the deal that has been on the table that was painstakingly negotiated. Uh, among the P5 plus one and the deal that we have been prepared to accept since March for months now. Uh, so the holdup uh, to, to the extent we have not been able to achieve a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA uh, has not been, um, we have not been the cause of that. Uh, there has been uh, one country that has uh, prevented uh, a return to compliance with the JCPOA, uh, that is uh, Iran. Uh, we have made very clear that we are prepared uh, to return to compliance with the GC JCPOA, assuming that uh, Iran does the same. We have made that clear publicly. Uh, we have conveyed that message privately, if indirectly, uh, to the Iranians. Uh, what we have not seen from Iran, uh, whether in March or in the ensuing months, uh, is an indication from them that they are prepared to make that political decision necessary uh, to return to compliance with uh, the JCPOA. Uh, that's why we've continued to prepare equally for scenarios where we have a JCPOA, scenarios in which uh, we don't have uh, a JCPOA. The deal remains on the table. We've heard from the high representative uh, of the proposal that he's put forward. Uh, we'll engage privately uh, with our European allies, but uh, again, we have been uh, willing to accept the deal that has been on the table for uh, some time now, and Iran has not. Given that lack of movement, where does that leave the hopes for the other Americans detained in Iran? You know, um, given that given that there's been so long without without Iran seemingly moving on the, on, on on these negotiations, then where does that leave it uh, in terms of trying to get those Americans home? Well, all throughout this, Simon, we've been very careful not to tie the fates to these wrongfully detained Americans uh, to a potential mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, we've always, uh, we've been under no illusions that uh, a return to the JCPOA uh, would necessarily be in the offing. We knew this would be uh, a tough set of negotiations, uh, and we were careful not to tie the fates of uh, these wrongfully detained citizens uh, to what, to our minds, always has been an uncertain proposition. And I think the Iranian intransigence, uh, the lack of constructive Iranian engagement, uh, has only underlined uh, for us the uncertainty of this proposition. Uh, so even as we have discussed uh, via our European allies and other P5 plus one parties, uh, the modalities of a potential return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, we've worked on a separate track uh, to seek to uh, secure the release of uh, these Americans. And just, just another sort of separate issue, just quickly. Um, <clears throat> since the, uh, the Secretary met with the family of Shireen Abu Akbar the other day, uh, is there any update on, on whether you would support uh, the U.S. conducting its own investigation, um, you know, how, how long are you gonna are you gonna wait for for this accountability that you've been talking about? And and just uh, I think today some members of Congress are, are suggesting that 
they can uh, ask for the State Department to uh, provide a report on, on the case, you know, is that something that the state uh, is willing to do? Uh, so I'll start with that uh, last point. Uh, of course, we'll continue to, to um, communicate with uh, Congress on this important matter. After all, this was the death of an American citizen, uh, an American citizen whose fearless journalism uh, had uh, been a source not only of uh, information, but uh, also inspiration uh, for so many uh, around the world. And so we'll continue to communicate uh, closely and privately with members of Congress uh, on this case. But in terms of uh, a report, uh, you may recall, I'm sure you do, that uh, on July 4th, earlier this month, the State Department published a, a statement uh, that uh, summarized the findings of the U.S. Security Coordinator. Uh, that uh, work on the part of the U.S. Security Coordinator uh, was itself a summation of the investigations that uh, Palestinians uh, and Israelis uh, at that time had undertaken. Uh, our focus has uh, been on bridging those investigations. Um, we believe, we continue to believe, that uh, by bridging those investigations, as we've been able to do, uh, at least to some extent, uh, that it will most effectively uh, allow uh, this process to culminate uh, in accountability. And that's what's important to us, uh, that this culminates in accountability. Uh, when the secretary met with the family of uh, Shireen Abu Akhla earlier this week, uh, not only did he express his heartfelt uh, condolences uh, to the family, but he made very clear uh, the priority we attach uh, to seeing accountability for her death, uh, in this case, to seeing to it that uh, steps are taken to uh, put in place protections uh, so that something like this um, can't happen again, or at least additional uh, safeguards to protect against uh, something like this from happening again. Can we stay in Israel? Uh, Israel will allow Palestinians in the West Bank to travel abroad through the Ramon <laughs> and the PA is not excited at all about this idea and demanding that Israel allow the Palestinians to build a new airport in the West Bank. Now, what is the U.S. view in this uh, regard? Well, without speaking to this specifically, we would welcome all efforts that enable Israelis and Palestinians to enjoy uh, equal measures of freedom, uh, prosperity, and democracy. Uh, that includes all measures to facilitate increased freedom of travel uh, for the Palestinian people. And uh, uh, on another topic uh, on Israel too, uh, Axios uh, has reported that Israeli uh, officials held a call with uh, senior advisor uh, Epstein and White House Middle East coordinator uh, Beth McGurk on Tuesday and provided their updated with position towards the maritime dispute with Lebanon. Uh, per the report, the Israeli officials uh, see a moment of opportunity to solve the dispute. Uh, what's your assessment in this regard? I'm not in a position to confirm uh, the details of, of, of that report, but what I can say is that, uh, as you know, Amos Hochstein was uh, in the region, both in Israel and Lebanon, uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. Since then, he has remained in close contact uh, with uh, Israeli counterparts as well as with uh, Lebanese counterparts, uh, we have been able to uh, help facilitate uh, some progress. And that continued engagement uh, with both parties is part of an effort uh, to see to it that that momentum continues. Uh, and I suspect that uh, he will remain in close touch uh, with uh, both governments going forward. And my last question uh, on Lebanon. Uh, Reuters has reported that a U.S. sanctioned uh, ship owned by the Syrian government has uh, docked in Lebanon, Tripoli, carrying uh, grain stolen from Ukraine. Do you have any comment? I'm not in a position to comment on any particular uh, ship or, or this report specifically. I saw it just uh, uh, shortly before I, I came out here. But uh, what I can say is that uh, we have uh, been in a position to confirm the fact uh, that the Russians have uh, pilfered grain belonging to uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, tons of Ukrainian grain uh, has made its way uh, to uh, the international market uh, that has uh, on Russian ships, uh, grain that belongs to the people of Ukraine. Uh, so we have sought to shine a spotlight on this, uh, to shine a, shine a spotlight on it as one of the practices uh, that is preventing the free flow of grain to 
uh, the global marketplace uh, to um, a marketplace that would uh, enable that grain to reach the people who need it uh, most. Uh, it is part and parcel of the broader set of Russian actions uh, that have exacerbated the challenge of food insecurity uh, that has uh, led to such uh, devastating consequences uh, throughout the world, from Sub-Saharan Africa to Latin America uh, to parts of uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, as well. Uh, final question, Alex. Oh, wait, I got one more. Okay. Uh, back to the investment um, fund statement. Uh, we haven't got involved into this. Thank you. Because it's a very complete report. So I just read reports on Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. I was just wondering uh, how much do they reflect the latest situation given the implications of Russian aggression in the region? And my second question, is there any reason why I cannot find Ukrainian report? I mean, there is no Russian report either, which is total fair, given the sanctions put on Ukraine. So you're right that among the 160 or so economies included, uh, included in these reports, uh, Ukraine and, and Russia uh, are not featured. Uh, we weren't in a position to collect uh, the appropriate data uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and of course, Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine has uh, led to dramatic shifts uh, in the marketplace conditions in Russia. Uh, it's no secret. You heard from the secretary yesterday, uh, in fact, that uh, some 1,000 multinational Companies have left uh, the Russian marketplace. It's a, a very uh, quickly evolving um, set of market conditions, evolving in a way that um, is not conducive uh, to business or international uh, investments. So uh, we were not in a position to, to write a, a country report for Russia. Okay. Okay. Question on implications for the other regions like how, how much do you think current ongoing Russian war is affecting the region and how much is reflected in this report? How much is reflected in, in, in this report? reports that were released today, because they are 2022 reports. That's right. Uh, we're wondering how much do they reflect current like a situation? Uh, well, again, our uh, our goal with uh, engagement with the South Caucasus uh, is to move forward uh, towards that uh, comprehensive peace that we've that we've talked about. Uh, I'm not certain that uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Uh, I think the reports will. Uh, discuss if there's been any, impl any implication for uh, market conditions uh, in the South Caucasus, uh, but we need to refer you to the reports for that. Matt? Sorry, that question was about, I'm sorry, I was dealing with something else, but that question was about the investment climate. Yes, reports. yes. Okay, well, in fact, Russia and Ukraine are in the investment climate reports. They are listed. I haven't gone and read them in detail, but there are a number of countries that are left out. The state sponsors of terror. Uh, terrorism, for example, are, are not included. North Korea, Syria, Iran, and Cuba. Uh, but of those four countries, the administration has actually moved to try to open up at least limited investment mm -hmm. in Cuba. So why, 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 why aren't they included? And I realize that you might not be the best, uh, the most authoritative person to speak about this. It might be a commerce, but why, why, why wouldn't they? Also, Venezuela is not included. Neither is East Timor. Uh, are they just, they're not even worth putting out? And the other question I have about this is that why why are there two sections for um, China? One for China and one for Hong Kong. It's my understanding that this administration, like the previous administration, essentially said that there's no difference anymore. Uh, so I have to correct you. There is no report for Ukraine this year. There may be a, a placeholder for it, but there is no report for Ukraine this year. Uh, there, okay, I'm looking at it right for Russia, just and there's no report for Russia either. Uh, I'm so looking at it right now. You may be looking at last year's or previous years, but Ukraine but, country commercial guide on the commerce on the International Trade Administration commerce website. Uh, you may be looking at something else, but there is no. Uh, I, I, this is the link that was in the release. <laughs> your colleagues in the room have also pulled it up. So, uh, but it, I can tell you there is no Ukraine country report or Russia country report this year. Um, regardless, uh, in countries and economies where the situation on the ground makes gathering this information uh, particularly difficult, we uh, don't publish uh, these reports. Consistent with that, there is no uh, Ukraine report this year. Um, the uh, uh, fully suspect when it comes to Ukraine that we will see reflected uh, the brutal implications of, of Russia's aggression in, in future reports. Uh, when it comes to specific uh, countries, uh, again, when conditions aren't amenable to gathering this data, uh, or in some cases given unique circumstances, uh, inclusion on the SST, uh, maybe one such consideration, uh, reports uh, aren't, uh, aren't compiled annually. 
Thank you very much. Yes.